Good evening. Goodbye Forever by Nakchang Rimshe, Volume 2. Chapter 30, Part 1. Dujam Rimshe. England. I'd lived a colourful, vigorous life in that green and pleasant land. It had sometimes even been replete with hope and glory, but now that life was gone. Well, that's not quite true. The artistic hero heroics of the 1960s had been slipping away since my first Himalayan journey in 1971, but the interconnective tendrils that had made the 1960s seem more tangible at times than they were. The palpable connection with my life in the 1960s had been based on secondary causes and as soon as those causes were not present, it seemed like a historical novel. It wasn't Jane Austen. It wasn't Jack Kerouac's On the Road or Dharma Bums, but it may as well have been. Almost every art student had read Jack Kerouac, and most of them, before 1972, had seemed like extras from Kerouacian movies. There was a version of me who could have ridden out of one of those novels or out of the movie Easy Rider. As soon as I stepped out of the bus outside Naroji's store in Macleod Gange, 1971 segued into 1975. It was as if I'd been in England for a year. Then the year telescoped into a month, a week, a day, and now into no time at all. It was as if I had simply fallen asleep and dreamed a three years illustration degree. Bristol Art School had been a period in which two characters coexisted. Nakpachurgyam experimenting with what life was like for a Nyingma Vajrayanist in British art school culture and Vic Simerson the art student who maintained Dujumte practices in private. Vic Simerson obtained a first-class honours degree, but somehow failed to be accepted for a master's degree at the Royal College of Art. There is a long, somewhat Machiavellian story that could be told about that, but it is of little interest in this account. It didn't really matter one way or another to the young man who had returned to the Himalayas and who would be with Kyabje Dujum Rimshe Jigdro Yeshe Dorje in a matter of weeks. Little remained of Vic Simerson that had not suffered a sea change. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes, Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change. Into something rich and strange, sea nymphs early ring his knell. Ding dong, hark, now I hear them. Ding dong bell. It wasn't that I'd altered entirely. I could still be a whimsical wag, but that 1960s surrealist adventurer had become a set of clothes, an appearance sometimes worn. I could still sing blues, I could still paint and write poetry, yet these propensities were now the chameleoid inflections of a changeling. I'd once felt like a Mississippi changeling, the misplaced son of a sharecropper. It was never a hard-wired fantasy, merely the personal poetry of existence. I'd looked at photographs of Sun House and felt an impossible ethnic affinity. Sun House was a man who was more or less the same age as my father. In some way he'd become my father, and that delusion had fuelled my stage persona with the Savage Cabbage Blues Band. Then, after Ron and Steve died, it fuelled me as a solo Delta Blues non-entity on the home county's pub circuit. 
Now I was living in the Western Himalayas, feeling the same kind of impossible ethnic affinity with the Gurkha Changlo wing of the Nyingma tradition. The Tibetans were refugees, and in some ways I was also a refugee. It struck me more than once that I found it easier to identify with the disenfranchised than with the English. Could it be because I was half German? I gave that thought some time, but couldn't say I'd ever felt anything other than English. I had no pull to go and live in Germany, no matter how much I preferred the food. I'd always been a hybrid. I was the son of a working class English father and an upper middle class German mother. My mother's family had moved down quite severely in society due to her father's antipathy to Hitler. My father had moved up in the world. He'd taken advantage of a military education and become a major, albeit a wartime major. He had never been accepted on equal terms by other officers and that never ceased to rankle with him. A disastrous divorce settlement had pulled him down, not into penury but into a need for thrift that never settled well with him. My mother's family were ruined by Hitler and the war and so our family was a curious anomaly. I was a working class lad with upper middle German class table manners. At school, I was neither a mod nor a rocker. I failed to identify with either. Motorcycle jackets and US Army Parker coats seemed equally attractive. That was apparently not comprehensible to either camp. Even though I'd grown my hair and looked like a hippie, I never bought the entire package. I abjured drugs. I didn't adopt counterculture jargon. I starched and ironed my Levi's. I wore brogues. As an art student, I was a hybrid in as much as I found my own niche as a figurative fine artist on an illustration degree. Now I was an Englishman in India and feeling more at home than I'd felt for three years. I wondered what it would be like to hitch a ride with Doctor Who and meet Vic Simerson, beau of Lindy Dale, in 1968. Farquhar Arbuthnot, vocalist and backup bass player with Savage Cabbage, in 1969. Frank Schubert, solo Delta Blues player and art student, in 1970. And finally, the first version of Chugyam, fresh back from the Himalayas in 1971. Four years seemed like 40 years, even without recourse to time travel. The Beatles song from the Revolver album ran through my mind. She said, I know what it's like to be dead. I know what it is to be sad. And she's making me feel like I've never been born. And yes, I knew what it was like to be dead. To a certain extent, I knew what it was to be sad. Not that I was fundamentally sad, but I sometimes had a certain sense of mourning for the versions of myself who had died. That sadness never lasted more than a moment or two because I was fundamentally happy. I was basically a paradox even to myself. In some way, happiness and sadness had a similar flavour when they were not too intense. In this, I made no pretension to non-dual realisation. It was more as if these emotions were non-exclusive and equally to be valued. 
I was happy because I'd made what felt to be the right decision. And I was ever so slightly sad for the same reason. My mourning for the friends I'd lost was not something I wished to transcend because it was tied in with the depths of my appreciation for Steve Bruce and Ron Larkin and also, to a lesser extent, for Lindy Dale, whose parents had decreed that she was not to consort with me. That was back in 1968. Steve and Ron, however, were my treasure as well as my triste and they were always there in some way as part of the atmosphere I inhabited. I might not think of them for weeks at a time, but they were always there. They were there in my mind when I arrived in India, but took their leave as the rickety bus chugged higher into the foothills of Himachal Pradesh. I would first spend time with Nakpa Yeshe Dorje and Kando Tenzin Drolka in Forsyth Bazaar and Macleod Ganj before setting out for Nepal. I had met Nakpa Yeshe Dorje and Kando Tenzin Drolka first in 1971 and that meeting created a number of causes, the effects of which were now playing out. Certain people can take a jaunt to the Himalayas and return. Others never return. I was one of the ones who never returned. Not that I stayed in the Himalayas, but they stayed with me. I'd tried to work out a compromise. I'd planned to become an art school lecturer and keep returning to the Himalayas in the winter and spring breaks. I was even to have taken a sabbatical every once in a while. Then, when I retired, I could spend as much time as I wished immersed in Vajrayana Buddhism. It's astonishing how a 19-year-old can plan the rest of his life as if it wasn't extremely rare for life plans to run their course. The plan didn't cause me any problems, however. In fact, it was necessary in order to make the most of art school whilst also being a serious Vajrayana practitioner. I remembered Mrs Pendrake's Bible class at Netherfield School. She'd been an appalling teacher, but the Bible references and quotations had remained with me. No man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon both. Matthew 6, 24. I didn't see art as mammon. It wasn't a question of adoring one and despising the other, but the energy required to experience anything totally necessitates the death of divided loyalties. Divided loyalties had always caused me problems in the world of the arts. At art school I'd been obdurately interdisciplinary, but you can't be interdisciplinary as a disciple. If you arrange a list of priorities for your life, something has to take first place. After the first place is taken, Everything else is secondary, tertiary, and so on, till it hardly registers. I stayed in Macleod Ganj for a month before setting out for Nepal. I'd have left earlier, but Dujam Rimshe wouldn't have been in Bodhanath at that time. I was sorry not to be able to head out earlier, but I'd have the advantage of cooler weather crossing North India. The luck was not with me, however, and the train journey was barbaric in terms of temperature and the 22-hour delay at Gorakhpur. Sitting at Gorakhpur station waiting for a train that was 22 hours late was somewhat taxing. I couldn't leave the station because, according to the station supervisor, the train could arrive any minute. Very soon coming, sir, very soon and he said that every few hours. I survived on chai, Indian tea, which was fortunately of rather poor quality, 
I say fortunately because I've never liked sugar in tea or full cream milk and the usual condensed milk used in chai made it nauseating to me. Condensed milk would have been expensive so the chai waller spared me that horror and stinted on the milk into the bargain. The chai was brought around every so often by a young lad, the chai waller, and I relished it. To make masala chai, you need equal parts of milk and water with sugar, cardamom, cinnamon, ground cloves and ginger. The mixture is then brought to a boil and loose black tea is added. The chai is immediately taken off the heat, covered and allowed to sit for approximately 10 minutes to allow the black tea to infuse into the chai. The chai is then strained and served. The chai waller served it in once fired earthenware beakers, which you'd simply throw onto the railway tracks when you'd drunk the tea. Because the beakers were once fired earthenware, they'd dissolve in the first rain and turn back into clay. There was perfection to that idea. It somehow gave me great cheer. Litter-free litter, how amazing. I was also cheered by the delight on the chai waller's face when I hurled my beaker onto the tracks and purchased another. I did offer to let him refill my beaker, but he'd have none of it. No, sir, this I cannot doing, always knew must be having. The train finally came and took me to Raxall Junction and from thence I caught a bus at Bergenj, the border town, for crossing into Nepal. By the time I got through customs and immigration and caught the bus for Kathmandu, I was heartily relieved to be out of India and heading for a higher altitude with cooler weather. Having ridden a bus to Kathmandu before, I decided to ride the roof rack. That's not as risky or uncomfortable as it might seem. The roof rack is usually laden with rucksacks and bales of this and that, which means you can snuggle down into a position where you're padded on all sides. The major advantage of riding the roof rack is that you can jump clear should the bus plummet into a thousand foot gorge. It happened. I'd seen the wreckage several times as the bus took mountain road corners at inadvisable speed. Sometimes there'd be an ominous clunk as one of the wheels skimmed a boulder on the roadside, just on the edge of an abyss. I never had to make that leap, although if I had, the result would have resulted in fractures, at least. Fractures, however, seem better than certain death trapped inside the bus. I arrived in Kathmandu a little chilled from the mountain passes, but otherwise relatively perky. Once I'd stretched enough to remove the aches of the journey. Freak Street, Kathmandu, was as it ever was. I found a cheap place to stay. It was never possible to go directly to Bodhanath. That would have been my preference. But there are worse things in the world than a night spent on Freak Street.